Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Let's see. What time is it? Six o'clock. Is Cindy with us tonight or is it still Brett? Cindy should be here. Hey, Cindy. Hey, Cindy, do we have everybody? We are waiting on Council Member Soroka. Is he on yet, Cindy? He is now, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, sounds like we have uh, all the council members on, so we will go ahead and get started. We will call the Johnston City Council meeting. Where is it? Work session. Work, work session number 20-23 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Council Member Cope? Here. Evans? Here. Martin? Here. Reddy? If okay. here, we'll begin by we'll begin by reading the COVID nineteen statement due to the COVID nineteen pandemic and in accordance with Governor Reynolds' March 19, twenty twenty proclama proclamation suspending the regulatory provisions of Iowa Code Section twenty one point eight or any other statute imposing a requirement to hold a public meeting or hearing. The City of Johnson will conduct meetings electronically with the public allowed to attend. Per instructions denoted on the meeting's particular agenda. Meeting minutes will continue to be posted for the city's normal course of business. We'll move into the agenda items. We have several this evening, so we'll need to continue to move through them pretty efficiently. The first one, 4A, discuss outline for the Herd Garden Development Agreement. And is that Adam? Yes, Mayor. Good evening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cindy, if we could start out by pulling up the Erd Gardens vicinity map, please. Uh, over the last few months, the staff has been working through the uh, proposed road design for the intersection of Merle Hay Road and Johnston Drive. Uh, this improvement is being proposed in part uh, due to the pending Ignite project uh, to the west of Merle Hay Road. Uh, there's also been discussions and the platting of Johnston Crossing, which is on the Far east side of 5625 uh, is on the non-consent agenda for uh, consideration this evening. And a couple of other projects uh, on the Earth Gardens property have been discussed as uh, possibilities in the last couple of months as well. Um, pulled up here the vicinity map, uh, just so everybody has kind of the same basis point. Uh, when I refer to the Earth Gardens property, uh, I'll be generally referring to this entire area outlined in blue. Um, Actually, that's a little incorrect, uh, but um, this property is kind of what we colloquially know as the Earth Gardens property that is not all owned by the Denny Elwell Company, although the southern portions and most of the western portions are. Uh, but there are a number of uh, individually privately owned properties and houses uh, on the northern part of this general area. Um, but uh, for the discussion's sake this evening, I'll sort of be referring to Earth Gardens as this entire uh, outlined blue area. Uh, Cindy, if you could pull up uh, next for me the uh, Erd right away PDF. Coming. Apparently, it's big. Well, while that's while that's thinking here, um, so with sort of all that in mind. Uh, We've sat down with uh, the Denny Elwell company and started having some conversations about what the impacts on this property will be over that intersection improvements. Uh, and you can see here uh, the proposed temporary easements uh, that will be needed or could be used uh, for part of this construction of that intersection improvements, as well as the proposed uh, expansion of the public right-of-way uh, for the addition of lane uh, and the 
addition, other improvements to Johnston Drive. Uh, that would be the area in red. And then you'll also see uh, a potential road, which is part of the, the dis discussion related to the development agreement, uh, heading north uh, in between the uh, three red buildings there. And then you'll see a little bit of the curve going west, and then it proceeds uh, all the way north to 55th. Uh, and potentially intersects with Jordan Port, uh, which is uh, just directly behind uh, the Panera Bread building uh, where the condos are. Uh, and then next, if you could pull up for me uh, the site tree survey or gardens updated map, the last one there. And then just for his reference, um, and as part of this development agreement discussion, in 2002, there was a tree survey uh, done on portion of this property, uh, the True Herb Gardens property, which is a former kind of a nursery, uh, kind of outlined some of the unique and special trees that were on this property. Uh, I will note, uh, it's, it's obviously an 18 year old tree survey at this point. Uh, we've had Parks Department take a look at a few of those trees, particularly on the Western side, just to see what's currently out there. Uh, and give a few updates. You can see uh, some of those elms are no longer present, uh, but historically speaking, there's been three or four trees that have been kind of called out as a particularly special or unique uh, to Iowa. Uh, the uh, European green beech tree uh, there on the very southern south, that's actually in the existing right of way, uh, so that's on city property there. Uh, it has been trimmed over the years due to the power lines, uh, but it appears to be in fairly good condition other than that. Uh, the Katsura tree directly to the north of that, uh, but within that temporary right away or that temporary easement that would be proposed as part of this development agreement. Uh, we've noted a couple of beech trees that are also directly to the west of that. Uh, and then just north of that uh, kind of bubble box there for that beech tree, you'll see a bald cypress tree, uh, which is also highlighted in yellow. So just wanted to kind of set the stage with all of those there. Uh, as far as the development agreement, uh, as I mentioned, the, the intersection improvements are going to cause some medians to be installed on this property. Uh, that's going to restrict some full access onto this site. Uh, that hasn't historically been an issue because the site is primarily undeveloped from a commercial standpoint. Uh, but as we see the gateway kind of coming to fruition with the Ignite project and the proposed Johnston Crossing and a couple of other projects here, We've been uh, encouraging the developer and had some conversations and trying to figure out how this site will orderly develop uh, with uh, better traffic patterns and in light of this intersection improvement. Uh, as part of that, uh, because of the full access restrictions that would be created and in the future land use map, we do show that north-south connection. Uh, and we'd like to see a way to get that facilitated to help create some of those additional accesses to those future commercial sites. And so you see kind of the outline here, one through seven, uh, kind of talking about both how to get that road potentially constructed, as well as how to work together with the developer uh, to, potentially, to potentially develop this site uh, in alignment with the city's gateway plan uh, that was put together a number of years ago. Uh, so currently uh, the Danny Elwell Company is in support of what we have here as a, an outline for that development agreement. Uh, we wanted to talk through this this uh, evening um, to see uh, where City Council's preference was. Uh, there's still opportunities to adjust this and have further dialogue with the developer. Uh, but if we're in general agreement on the, uh, the overarching themes of this, uh, that will help uh, move the Johnston's Crossing project forward here tonight, which again is on the far east side of that Earth Gardens property. Uh, and we can start drafting this into a formalized development agreement uh, so that that intersection is ready to go uh, and those future access uh, to the future commercial properties are available. We're kind of going through the bullet points here. What we're proposing is some cost sharing for that north-south road connection. Uh, what we would do is establish uh, a sub-TIF area that encompasses that blue outlined herd gardens property. Uh, as those properties develop and an additional commercial TIF increment is generated on those, we would set those aside into a particular fund. And at such point that the developer is ready to construct that north-south road, uh, the city would, upon accepting that road as complete or partially complete, uh, provide a forgivable grant for up to 40% of that road construction costs. Um, these grants would only use that increment within that herb gardens property area for the commercial projects um, facilitated by the developer, uh, the Denny Elwell Company. 
Uh, the developer would also agree not to pursue rezoning of any of that ground for ground floor residential uses on the west 800 feet of the Earth Gardens, so that's south of the high tension power lines that run through the property on an east-west trajectory, or on the west 400 feet north of those power lines. Developer would also agree not to pursue any development that's currently restricted under the property's zoning code or any convenience stores with fuel sales, adult, bus adult businesses, mini warehouses, truck stops, car dealerships, or any other types of use consistent with that intensity or physical characteristic, style or size, the purposes listed above. Uh, going back to the road for a moment, um, both has done a preliminary analysis of that road connection. They estimate that just the road component construction at approximately $700,000. So that $40,000 would mean a maximum grant of $300,000 from the city, the rest privately funded. The forgivable loan would be provided as a lump sum to the developer, again, upon that dedication of that road, if those TIF funds are already available. Uh, if those full TIF funds are not already available due to the increment generated on the Earth Garden site, uh, further grants would be provided as that increment becomes available uh, until that complete grant is uh, completed uh, or the uh, development timeline uh, is expired or the state code uh, has terminated the TIF district. Uh, we also allow for the provision that uh, that northwest or the north-south connection could be constructed in two phases, uh, which might be preferable depending on how the, uh, the development uh, turns out. And then we also consider the idea of increasing that forgivable loan percentage up to 80% of that road cost, a maximum of $600,000. If that developer, if the developer causes the construction of at least 50,000 square feet of a high quality hotel, full service restaurants, desirable entertainment businesses, high quality retail, or other development is determined by the city council's discretion uh, is to be appropriate with uh, what the desires are within the gateway area. Uh, again, any portion of that north-south road connection not completed by June 1st of 2030 would not be eligible for the give forgivable loan unless this agreement is otherwise extended or modified by the city council. And the developer will de dedicate at no cost to the city uh, that permanent right-of-way, which was shown in red in the previous map, as well as the temporary easement that was shown in the yellow. Uh, and then we have in here as well uh, that the city would cause the clearing of the trees within that permanent right-of-way and that temporary easement with the exception of possible the Katsura tree, uh, which is located near that intersection was highlighted uh, on the southwestern portion of the property. Uh, it's also presumed that that uh, green birch, which is in the existing city right-of-way, will need to be removed as part of the road project. Uh, but my understanding is both is looking at an option, whether that can be avoided um, but uh, based on the preliminary information, it sounds like that might be challenging. Uh, the final note there is the forgivable loan would be repayable to the city in full or in part at the city's discretion uh, if the developer was in violation of the terms of this development agreement. Uh, so again, this is uh, the tentative outline uh, for what we might hope to achieve with moving forward the development on your gardens property. Uh, it has been undeveloped for uh, about 20 years now for the most part. Uh, since the uh, firmer nursery closed. Uh, there's a few reasons for that, but there have been a number of projects proposed over the years. Um, but again, hopefully with the movement of the Ignite project and some other initiatives in the gateway, uh, we're starting to see some more activity on this. Uh, and with those intersection improvements, the timing's sort of right uh, to resolve uh, a number of the issues that are sort of outstanding on this property uh, to help facilitate those transitions uh, and the road improvements. So I'll pause there, uh, see if uh, Mayor or Council have any questions. Adam, I think you probably said this, but um, is uh, you, you've had conversations with uh, the Denny Elwell company and are they generally agreeable to what's been proposed here? Uh, yes, staff has uh, sat down with uh, Chris Murray uh, and he is supportive of the uh, development agreement as outlined. Uh, Mayor, do you have more questions? Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. So, can you, Adam, can you just outline a little bit what the, uh, so you've got kind of obviously that yellow rectangle kind of on the west end going um, north south. What's, what is kind of the, the need for that temporary easement or what's the purpose of that temporary easement? 
Sure. So the temporary easement north on Johnston Drive is really needed to facilitate that road construction. Uh, there's also typically a need for some mobilization area uh, to allow for equipment storage uh, and the improvements in the adjoining area. Um, the LL company was willing to provide that space uh, along the road front. Uh, so the general size of it is sort of uh, driven by what Foth believes is needed for mobilization area. Uh, the specific location of it all uh, is sort of being determined in part just by what's convenient uh, and what the preference was by the uh, well company. Okay, that's helpful to, kn to know. And so in, the, in your kind of the bullet point summary, you talk about tree removal in that area. Is, it basically is the intent of that language sort of that if there's a need to remove trees in that area that the city would bear the cost of that? Or is, it, is, it, is the idea to remove all of the trees in that area? Because it's a little unclear to me from that bullet point what the intent of that section is. Uh, the intent is to uh, clean up that area to create the sight lines into the property. Um, again, we've had a number of projects proposed in the area that would uh, require most of these trees to be removed, presumably otherwise, but also uh, protect some of those previously noted trees um, that have historically could have been marked as uh, special. Um, so that's why that Katsura one in particular is noted as uh, likely not to be removed. I, I don't have uh, the specifics from both of whether there's some elevation changes on the property between uh, what that new intersection road design and the existing terrain on the earth gardens might require some uh, soil removal, uh, removal or addition to that property. Uh, but it, my understanding is they probably would not be necessary, particularly within the yellows areas, yellow areas. Um, but as part of the deal to uh, get that temporary uh, easement uh, for that mobilization and as part of the overall plan to redevelop the property, um, that was the area that was uh, outlined under the development agreements for the uh, temporary uh, easement area and that the city would do the tree removal for that mobilization area to be ready and accessible by the, uh, the construction crew. So the development agreement requires that all trees, with the exception of the Katsua tree, to be removed. Is that what you're saying? Correct. That's what's being proposed under the outline. Okay. Adam, you said that uh, Fulth is taking another look at the Green Beach. Um, they're uh, close to Johnston Drive. Um, it looks like it's very close to the existing road. So. Um, you know, it does appear to, it's going to be difficult to save that tree, but why don't you, can you, can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about, um, you know, the construction that will occur there and what the, um, what the likely impact is going to be? I might ask Matt to uh, provide that. I think he probably has some additional uh, okay. knowledge and detail. Yes, we've uh, folks looked at this on a preliminary basis and looked at doing we've got some turning movement issues coming from the east headed southbound and we get quite the traffic back up um, peak rush hour times it looks like we would need to add a dual left turn lane and then add a through uh, right turn lane there on the north side um, so that's what currently Foth is looking at I know when we met last week they were going to take a look um, based on some um, questions from a couple of council members of trying to save that um, green beech tree there in the right of way. With that information that we got just last week, I think um, they'll be taking a look at that this week and reporting back to us. Okay. This is probably a question for uh, Councilwoman Martin, but what, what is the uh, uh, life expectancy of these trees? Um, the shingle oak uh, could live for, you know, 100 years plus. Um, I don't know what the life expectancy of a, a European beech tree is. Uh, we all know that those trees are already probably 75 years old. Um, and they seem to do, need, seem to be doing okay. The same thing with the cypress it could live a long time, although we had a very nice cypress at uh, Dewey Park that was that just died for no good reason that we could tell 
couple years ago. Um, there's no no, there's no telling uh, how long they could live. Uh, the, these there was four trees. We've got we've all received this email from Vir, Virginia Solberg uh, talking about um, four significant or landmark trees. One of them is this shingle oak that is on the plan. And uh, she's also provided some documentation from 2003 uh, that seemed to show a willingness on the part of uh, Denny Elwell's company to, to preserve these trees. Um, and as we talked, Mayor, in our uh, public works meeting, I mean, I think that these trees were a big factor when this property was sold and herd gardens moved away, there was a lot of uh, community support for saving trees on this property that they were special. Um, so my thoughts on this mayor is regardless of how long they could maybe live, I still think that they're, they're you know, they're part of our history. Uh, at one time, uh, Johnston had several and still does but had several uh nurseries here in town in fact we, we were the place to go for a lot of nurseries we had the town was based on some very nice topsoil and uh, herd gardens miller nursery pbs which became um claydenburg all of those places ended up in johnston and and we kind of have a history of support for um this oper you know, nursery operations, trees, et cetera. So I'm going on and on, I don't mean to, but I'm just gonna say that I really support doing all we can to protect these trees. I would think that if we're gonna have a temporary easement for future development, it would not be hard for, for these trees to have a protection fence around them. Why cut them down before we know exactly what the final uh, development of this property is? Um, to have them cut down because of a temporary easement for a road project, when it looks like there's a lot of space there, that would seem to me unfortunate. Thank you. Yeah, Councilwoman Martin, you're, you're absolutely right about the history of the conversation around these trees. And that was part of the reason why I was asking about the life expectancy, because I think those conversations took place like 20 years ago. <laughs> So I thought, how long can these trees live? <laughs> I mean, they were mature, they were old mature trees then. So. Well, and Mayor, if I just could jump in, I, I do think that um, this is an issue in which you may have some history with, but you're probably the only one among the elected officials. I mean, I, you know, I, we drive by her gardens, right. you see big trees out there, you see that they've been fenced right. off and you heard, oh, those are protected, but, but but as far as any more detailed discussion that's happened in the council level in the last nine years, this is really the first time that's happened. And so I think it's a little, we're all acting under a little bit of, we don't all have a lot of background information. And so I guess the, the question, I, I certainly, from what Councilwoman Martin has said of looking at identifying individual trees and trying to protect those individual trees, I certainly don't have a problem with trying to do that. But, but I, but when we, but my concern is when it, when that goes from identifying certain uh, trees, such as the the shingle oak, and then kind of, but then pr granting protection to all the trees in the area, that I, I I'm I'm a little concerned that that might be a slippery slope, that that in the end, um, you know, how, where do we draw the line? And so again, that's you know obviously members of the community, others, you yourself, maybe some city staff have some familiarity with kind of the background and history of this, but that, but that's where it sort of stops. Um, and so I, I guess two things. One, I think we all need to have a little bit better understanding of kind of what the, uh, what the, what the knowledge level is. And I guess two, I'm certainly willing to, to look at protecting, um, you know, whether it be the bald cypress or the shingle oak or the katsua tree, but but when it goes to all the trees in the uh, uh, in the in that yellow shaded temporary easement, I, that makes me a little nervous because I think then that makes it very challenging um, uh, to accomplish what needs to accomplish as part of 
um, either the development of herd gardens or, or uh, the, the road construction that needs to happen in this area. So fine, I, I, I have faith that between uh, the city staff, elected official, interested citizens, the developer, we can, we can uh, find what that common ground is. Um, but I, but but I, I think we need to. We've got a ways to. Not, I wouldn't say a ways to go, but um, but I think we need to kind of take all those voices into consideration. I agree with you, Councilmember Culp. Um, I think that you know it probably wouldn't take staff very long at all to put together a very short memo on. Um, you know, what the conversation was at the time, uh, 20 years ago, when, when these, um, when the property was transferred and there was some discussion about these trees at that time. If I'm recalling the situation, we, and again, I'm starting to ramble a little bit as well, but if I recall, if I recall what, what, uh, what happened at the time was when herd, when herds owned this property and had their, their nursery there, they planted these trees knowing that they were unique and unusual to Iowa. And, uh, you know, that, you know, there was some, some thought that they may live or they may not live. And, and obviously they, they have, and they've done well. And, and uh, uh, it's just, uh, I've always thought it's unfortunate. They put it right at the location that they did. If they'd have moved it back further on the property, we probably wouldn't be having these conversations over and over again, because they'd be in a, a location that, uh, isn't always, um, you know, where development uh, will occur, whether it's road or or otherwise. But but these were these were trees that were particular, especially planted by them, knowing full well that they were not native to Iowa, um, and and uh, so that's that's what does make them special that they that they have thrived in an environment that they that um, that wasn't natural for them. So is that correct, Councilwoman Councilwoman Martin? Um, yeah, they're not that unusual um, okay. nowadays. The, the beaches are for, for sure. The shingle oak, maybe not as much or the bald cypress. I would say that I, I actually think that uh, I agree with a lot of what Councilman Cope said about um, blanket statements on tree removals. I think my, my, my point was about the temporary easement was that it's a temporary easement to facilitate a road project and they do need space to perform their operations. But to go ahead and say, you know, clear the site of trees, except for maybe the cat sir tree and the shingle oak so that they can have room seems to me short-sighted in terms of, we don't know what the final development is gonna be. And I think Councilman Cope, I think that the city and city staff can take a look at those trees and if it's an ash tree or a white pine or some less than healthy tree that or or if it's, you know, there's no way the road project could go in without this tree in the end being removed because it's in the actual way of the road. Uh, I would agree that that's a necessary removal, but for for just to open the site up to facilitate um, moving equipment around and then cut trees to make it convenient. That is where I'm saying I would be opposed to that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I, I think that our two perspectives are, are pretty, pretty comparable and, and reconcilable. So uh, I, I would, I, I have faith that, um, and I, and, um, Adam, Adam is not on video, so I have no idea. He may be throwing up his hands in disgust at this discussion or maybe nodding saying, yeah, this isn't a problem. Hard to tell because he's not uh, willing to show his face. But um, um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he's, uh, he's nodding his head saying, yeah, this seems, we, can, we can work this all out and, and uh, we're not talking about something that's too difficult, so. First words, Tom. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fine, you can see my face. There um, we go. So, yeah, I guess maybe in summary here, this is just a discussion item tonight. What we're looking for is uh, really general confirmation that the overall uh, development agreement is, is uh, more or less acceptable, uh, subject to working out some additional details to the city council so that the Johnston Crossing project can move forward this evening. Uh, I don't think there'd be an issue to, um, if there's that general support, 
uh, sit back down with maybe a small group and the developer and, and try to identify uh, specific trees or a more specific plan for tree removal as part of the intersection project uh, in advance of moving forward with the, uh, the development agreement itself, which uh, has not been drafted at this point. And I would also say, Adam, that I appreciate that that the developer is willing to have these discussions um, as opposed to, you know, there has been other developments that trees get removed before they start talking to us. And, uh, and I appreciate that they recognize that these trees are important and worth having a sit down discussion um, to clarify um, you know, what, what priorities and boundaries around them um, that they're willing to have that conversation. I really appreciate. Yeah, they've, uh, you know, they've protected the trees for, for 20 years now. Um, and uh, they've always indicated during discussions, uh, as far as long as I've been here, uh, when potential projects have come up that, uh, you know, they do want to work to try to protect them the best as possible. Uh, but you know, just looking at that survey of the, uh, the trees there, there's, there's a lot of trees and it's some prime commercial property. Uh, so it's, it's inevitable that a number of these trees will be removed, but I think we have a good partner as far as trying to work through uh, saving as many of the, uh, the important ones or uh, the unique ones as possible. And Adam, um, I know Tracy went through that area a little bit today in a short period of time. Um, certainly if uh, the developer would like us to assist a little bit, um, we can certainly go back through the area. Um, Tracy already noted some trees that have already uh, been eliminated that are on the site that are indicated on this, as well as that entire group of lindens are actually beached. They're not lindens, so there are some um, errors with this, but also some areas since it's been 18 years ago that trees don't exist anymore that are indicated here. So um, we can certainly help with that process and, and in, in some ways, maybe even get some of the tree board members to help out with it too. Mayor, if, if, may I provide just a little more history as well? Sure. Just, just to recall, after Heard Gardens vacated the property, there was another developer that I can't remember if they actually purchased it or was thinking about purchasing it. And, and they were looking at doing more of a clear cut of the property to prepare it for development. And um, that's, I think, where a lot of this activity began. And then in the meantime, Elwell purchased the property. And again, I don't remember if it was from Heard Gardens or from the, the, the group that was uh, sort of in the middle there. But, uh, and they have protected the trees as, as was identified almost 20 years ago. For the last 20 years. So I know they've made that, they made that commitment and, and have lived up to it. Now there's some development um, pressure activity opportunity, I guess, on this property. But, but there was uh, an effort 20 years ago to, to do what we could to protect this as long as we could um, from another developer that, that was active and, and uh, had the potential of purchasing this property at, at, at that time. Anything else on this item? Yeah, I guess maybe I'll just, uh, trees aside, is there any other comments or concern with uh, the other elements of the uh, outline development agreement? I think it's great, Adam. Yeah, I would agree. I'm not hearing any uh, disagreement, Adam. All right, thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to item 4B and I'll just remind everyone we have just 30 minutes to cover now uh, the four remaining items. So we'll need to move, uh, move along efficiently. Item 4B, review the Stillwater Utility Financial Analysis and Capital Improvement Program. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Dave Welding, Community Development Director. Um, Matt Stoffel is also on the line. Uh, Matt is our financial advisor with PFM. And um, we are required by ordinance to do an annual uh, fiscal analysis review of our stormwater utility, uh, which was created back in 2012. Um, and we usually do that at the same time that we review and update our capital improvements program. So, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, Cindy, if you want to just open the 
stormwater cash flow uh, document. Uh, so the stormwater committee, uh, which includes council members Reddy and Martin, Mayor Derenfeld met uh, back in uh, November, I believe, and, and reviewed this. Um, as council may recall, um, we've generally followed a, a pattern where every other year we do an increase in our ERU or equivalent residential unit stormwater utility rate. Uh, this is our off year, so we did do a rate increase last year. We are not proposing a rate increase this year, uh, but we do, do still want to go through annually and make sure that our fund is in good shape. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Matt to do a quick review of the of the model that he's created here, and then I can quickly touch base on the uh, capital improvements program. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, David. Um, I'll just speak to kind of the highest level, and uh, I would say just overall, the, the fund is in really good shape. Uh, staff has been able to kind of move projects uh, around to kind of align with the revenue streams. So for the unaudited uh, 2020 results, uh, the stormwater fund generated about $950,000. Um, in terms of operating expenses, the, the goal of this fund was to keep the operating expenses relatively low. So uh, in fiscal 20, 2020, there was about 316,000. Uh, most of those related to engineering expenses um, and then the depreciation of the assets. And so the debt service uh, is used to fund, fund the projects. Um, and so in, in 2020, there was about $250,000 worth of debt service um, from a revenue perspective. And then there's also some general obligation bonds that, um, that we transfer out of this fund to help offset stormwater projects that are paid for that would otherwise have to be paid for by property taxes. And so in fiscal um, 2020, there was four hundred twenty-six thousand dollars transferred into the uh, the debt service fund to offset property taxes for those projects. So, Cindy, if you want to go to the next page. Um, so there, there's a lot of activity happening in this fund at the moment. Um, the East of Merle Hay projects are flowing through here, but also um, there's several other projects that are kind of in detail below. Um, but overall, the fund um, drew down cash by about five hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars in 2020. So you can see the ending cash balance is uh, four hundred and ninety-two thousand, which represents um, about a year and a half worth of operating expenditures. And so we've we've kind of targeted uh, five hundred thousand as kind of the number um, that staff is comfortable with. Um, as a target to determine which projects do we fund with cash and which projects do we use the SRF program for and borrow from. So as cash builds up, we'll identify projects that can be funded with cash and, and to avoid the, the debt service. Um, so if you go to the next page, um, this is a list of the capital projects and the, and the projects that are on the top um, are kind of color coded by which loans um, and the source of funding that, that they use. But you can see um, most of the projects kind of start out um, as funded by debt service uh, because then you can spread the cost across the 20 years um, as opposed to drawing down cash uh, immediately. But as we're able to, we pull down projects. So for example, um, the North Glen stream improvements um, were done this year uh, on, a, a, on a cash basis to kind of pull down the cash balance in that fund. Um, we've got a few other projects identified out there in terms of cash, but as the cash balance will build, we'll identify other projects that are out in the future years to, to pull down as well. So um, I guess I'll stop there. That's kind of the, the quickest look at where the fund's at. I think it's in really good shape. I think staff is doing a great job managing um, the projects and within the revenue stream. Um, and I, I guess I'll turn it back over to you, David, if, if there's anything that you wanted me to mention that I didn't, I'm happy to speak to um, other aspects of the cash flow. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, one of the couple of things I'd highlight, um, just as a reminder, the of the revenue that comes into the fund we are primarily using that revenue to fund 
capital projects. So either through, um, you know, PAYGO or paying cash for those projects, those capital projects, or to pay debt service towards um, projects that we fund through an SRF loan. Um, we do set aside 10% of the budget approximately each year or revenue each year for operations and maintenance. That does not include staff time uh, or other things that we were already doing prior to the establishment of the, of the stormwater utility, such as street sweeping or other, other things. That includes sort of regular ongoing maintenance that's required for our stormwater management system. And then we also set aside 1% of our revenue or about $10,000 a year for our homeowner grant program. So we are low in the fund as far as what we what we allocate towards operating and operations and maintenance. Um, so that I guess we'd be happy to answer any questions um, on the fund itself, the utility itself, or the or the capital improvement list of projects. We did only add one project to your, this year. The rest of the projects were already in the CIP last year. Uh, that's a project um, related to Terrace Drive Storm Sewer, which was on line 80 of that spreadsheet. Um, and that's needed to address some localized flooding that we've been experiencing there as a result of an undersized storm sewer. Uh, we do, um, in cooperation with um, Matt Greiner and his staff at Public Works, we do review each of these projects each year to sort of see what condition they're in, how rapidly they're changing, as well as a number of other ones that we're continually monitoring where we know we're having erosion issues to determine which ones sort of need to rise to the top or, or get added to the CIP. So this year we're only adding uh, one, one new project. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any question. As Matt said, the fund we believe is in really good shape. We're not proposing a rate increase. And um, aside from a couple, one new project and a couple of minor adjustments timing wise, no real changes to the CIP from last year. Also any questions? So uh, Dave, when you talk when you talk about adding a project, I'm just looking at uh, I think one of the charts here that Matt presented. So the like the terrace drive that's terrace drive storm sewer. So that's a, the new project you're talking about adding. Is that right? Correct. And that would be funded. Looks like it's funded out of pay as you go in FY21 and 22. Yeah, the, the design is in 21, 22. The, yep. the construction is in 22, 23. Yep. And so it looks like, so kind of on the pay as you go, we don't sort of plan those as far out in advance as we do on the bonding, because bonding, we have projects that planned out sort of through 25, 26, and 26, 27. And then the pay as you go is a little bit more, we, we kind of plan those at a little shorter time horizon. Is that right? A little bit. We also look at, um, we do have to meet certain criteria to use the SRF uh, funding. And so sometimes the, like in that particular case, and then the, um, the Point Vista Park case, um, we're really addressing sort of localized flooding issues that are harder to meet the SRF criteria. And so it's just easier to pay for those projects out of cash if we're able to. Uh, the other thing, and Matt alluded to this, as we get out into later years, um, I'm, I can assure you some of those projects will drop down under cash. We just tend to leave them up and assume that they're going to be uh, funded by debt. And then as we get a little bit closer, we, as we look at the, the, the fund balance and the health of the fund, we, if we feel we're able to, we'll, we'll move some of those down and, and, and use uh, PAYGO as much as we can. Thanks. You know, I think one of the, of all the things you kind of indicated today, one of the things that was most interesting is the fact that basically by having this fee in place, we're able to help divert about what four hundred thousand dollars or so of that otherwise would have been paid out of property taxes to help sort of pay for these stormwater projects. And so it's a it's a fee that although nobody really likes fees, it does help on the property tax side to make these important infrastructure improvements. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Any other comments or questions for David? Now, are we ready to go to the next agenda item? I am ready. Cindy, if you want to just bring up that uh, document. For um, review design concepts for park entrance signs and terrace park signs, John. Yep. Um, basically over the last uh, year or so, we have been working with Shive Hadry trying to look at uh, signage, uh, not only at Terra Park, but throughout our park system. 
Um, we currently have three different styles and three different logos that are currently present within park signage in the city. So looking to standardize what we're doing. Um, this design concept that you're looking at has uh, been reviewed completely by the park board, um, has been given the thumbs up from them. Um, I've been working uh, some with Janet and she's been reviewing these as well. Um, the key to these is to look uh, uh, fresh and sharp, um, but at the same time utilize logos. Um, at Terra Park, we're looking at really three uh, major different types of signage. One would be the large entrance sign, which is going to kind of blend in somewhat similar to what the overall building feel is. That's why you see the limestone and kind of the, the, the wood appearance of the sign. Um, the second type is park information, um, giving locations and some specific information about Terra Park. And then the third would be wayfinding, um, helping to direct people throughout the park and, and then also located, uh, located on the trails so that people coming into the park kind of have a good feel of where to go. People that want to divert Terra Park altogether can go behind on the, uh, the trail system. So those are the, the Terra Park. Um, on that first screen, you can see an example of Providence Point. That would be the typical type park signage. Um, these would be present at the major entrances to each park. Most parks only have one, but there are a couple parks that would have two that would need this. Um, then the final sign you see to the, towards the far right is the recognition interpretation. Um, this we've been working some with the uh, representatives from Corteva that helped um, designate um, the 70th, 70th Avenue access as the Shaquin Memorial access. Um, but this signage would be present there um, at the entrance of, of the 70th Avenue access. So with that, uh, I will take any questions that you may have. I know that's kind of a quick note, but uh, I know we also have other items to get to, so. So John, the, uh, for example, the pedestrian wayfinding, that, that that would uh, be placed along the trail system or? Along trail systems, near parking lots. There's really two different types of wayfinding. Um, you have the kind of the major in-park wayfinding and then you have the smaller um, trail type wayfinding where it directs you. Yeah, so here's, here's my question um, and it relates back to um, a comment that I made earlier this year about the kiosk uh, that are in the Beaver Creek Natural Resource Area. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm expecting that we'll see some of these pedestrian wayfinding signs out in the Beaver Creek Natural Resource Area. Correct. Okay. And so what what are we going to do with those kiosks, those um, educational kiosks? We did recently clean them back up. Um, we're going to try to establish some type of plantings around them that is more natural in nature, but not something that needs 100% maintenance. Um, the area floods in normal years, the area gets wet and floods pretty much annually around a lot of those different signs and uh, trying to keep the, the current vegetation that was planned there is, is virtually impossible. Um, so we're gonna come up with a better system of, of the vegetation and the material that are around those signs. That would be great. I, th I think that if we put this, I mean, I, 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 I'm very supportive of putting up the new uh, park and, and trail signage. Um, and I just want to make sure that uh, after we go to that effort and that expense that we're not overlooking the kiosk and detracting but from what we're trying to accomplish with a new signage. Yep, this new signage should add to it. In fact, uh, the group that from Shive Hattery that is working on this also did those signs. Um, so they understand the connection. Um, we're also working with a group with the, uh, the newly uh, installed Oxbow from this past year, um, looking at the possibility of some signage associated with that Oxbow, especially educational signage. And we're looking at trying to conform all these, uh, this signage to make sure that it looks uniform through that region. Great. Any other questions for John? So John, um, well, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Scott. You go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say quickly, um, no questions for me, um, but just something maybe to consider on the um, signage itself is, um, you know, I think it could be neat if, um, you know, we worked with Janet or something to create some kind of, even if it was just a unifying um, hashtag, something that would be able to link all of the parks. Uh, mainly I'm thinking as people go to these, see the signs, if we give them a hashtag, even if it's like hashtag Johnson Parks or something, mm -hmm. then um, I think that just encourages the exploration. People see it online. They find another Johnson Park that maybe they didn't know about. And you know maybe they see something for the Beaver Creek Water Point access, find out about Terra Park, and then you know, attract more people to visit our parks and you know that type of thing. So just something, a suggestion um, maybe to consider. Sure. Yep, we'll look into that. We'll, we're also uh, looking at most of these signs don't show it on here, um, but we have discussed with the uh, with the uh, designer that it'd be nice to have the address, the official address of each park present on these signs. So when people attend the park, they do know the address in case there's an emergency or something that they can give that address. Great, thank you. So my, my question kind of has to deal with, uh, and I, I don't know, Cindy, if you're, maybe, can you scroll back to the, the Providence Park one? Yeah, right there. So these, these um, it looks like they're leaves, these kind of, the, the, I'm trying to figure out what the pattern here is inside the green. Um, it, it looks like kind of leaves that are sort of blowing around. Kind of, is, what's the thought process on that? Is that sort of cons somewhat similar to our logo that has the leaves from the trees? I was just trying to figure out what the tie is there. Or what when I first saw it, it looked like teardrops a little bit to me. They're green, so that helps not to draw that. But I was trying to figure out what we were trying to convey with that uh, kind of visual. Yeah, it. The intent was to once again, um, Johnson being a green community, we wanted to give the impression of of leaves there without having the having the full tree there. So yes, those are intended to be leaves. We can work with them to make sure that they look a little bit more uh, convincing as leaves. I don't I mean it's it's it, it, it's it's probably fine. I, I just it wasn't I wasn't overly power overpowered by it right off the bat, but it's not horrible either. So. I like your suggestion, though, John, because I, I, you know, I didn't really identify them as teardrops until Councilman Cope called, said that that's what he first thought they were, and now that he has said that, that's what I see as teardrops. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, even if it's abstract, it needs to, you know, make sure that when people see it, they, they see leaves sure. and not something else. Any other comments or questions? I have a quick question. Uh, when do you think this will be installed? What we're yeah. looking for is is uh, part of uh, bringing it to you guys was to just get any final feedback. So if there's any modifications to the design, we can do such. Um, we're looking to get this bid out this winter time. Um, and the hope is right away in the spring, once we can get the footings put in, that they'll it'll go in probably April or May. All right. Thank you. Nice. Anything else? If not, let's move on to item 4D. Consider chapter 180.27 of the City of Johnson Code of Ordinances as it relates to proposed development north of Northwest 78th Avenue and west of North, Northwest 104th Court for property to be annexed into the City of Johnston. Uh, yeah, that would be me, Aaron Wolf, presenting okay. on this topic. Uh, Cindy, can you please open the vicinity map? Okay, so we have a developer who is um, looking to develop property that is um, north of Northwest 78th Avenue and west of Northwest 104th Court. Um, the properties along Northwest 104th Court are the Chesterfield Heights subdivision that was approved, gosh, I don't know, six, eight years ago. And uh, it's the same developer. He's looking to um, have a second phase of development to the west here. 
Um, the property that, that is uh, fronting Northwest 78th Avenue is a um, horse farm and stables. And um, he's looking to subdivide off 20 acres at the rear of that property for a phase two of, um, of his previous development. And Cindy, if you would, could you pull up the um, concept drawing that he submitted for the subdivision? It would be the uh, concept aerial that's there. <clears throat> There we go. And so here it's just um, flipped the other direction uh, to the to the left side of the screen would be the north. And um, Northwest 104th Court, again, that would be the uh, street there that you see at the, at the top of the screen. Um, that has access back to Northwest 78th Avenue. The Stub Street that you see here um, is Northwest 80th Avenue. And the developer would like to extend that to the west and uh, bring a cul-de-sac off of that extension. Um, and he's hoping to serve 28 homes. And he's looking for some preliminary input on this development concept, uh, particularly uh, how this extension of the public street um, relates to the, to the code of ordinances. Um, we do have some code language that stipulates a dead end street can only serve 250 average daily trips um, but have, the council does have the authority to approve a subdivision that creates a greater trip load when development occurs in phases and there is potential for a dead end street to um, connect back, uh, create a second access in the future. And so if we can keep looking at that concept uh, plan that we just had up. <clears throat> Um, Northwest 104th Court, again, it, it's, it's basically a temporary dead end. Um, it, it terminates in a cul-de-sac, but comes back down to Northwest 80th Avenue that has potential to extend further westward and eventually wrap back around to Northwest 78th Avenue. So there's potential in the future to get um, a second access to this development. What we're looking at here is, is basically a, a temporary, temporarily exceed the average daily trips for this um, for this street. And there is precedence for doing this, um, especially when we look at development that occurs in phases. And um, the developer is currently in his due diligence period for this property. He's looking for your comments and your willingness to temporarily exceed that average daily trip load. Um, and again, this is something that we routinely do, but I understand that he, he you know, before he moves forward, he would like to uh, hear comments from the council. I do believe we're joined by the developer tonight and his consulting engineer, um, if you have questions for them. Aaron, this is Councilman Cope. I, I don't have any concerns with um, what, what the developer is proposing, given kind of our history of allowing um, similar type projects throughout the community. I guess the one question I would have is, do we, from a city standpoint, you know, basically you're, you're indicating that the road that runs will run east-west is Stub Road or not, maybe that, I think he's not risen right, but that connects the development from the east to this development. Obviously that's running east to west. So at what, do we have any expectation for when the land to the west of this might be annexed into the city? Um, you know, is that a long, long ways off? Because if it, if it is a long, long ways off, or is it, or do we have a sense it's maybe more in the 10 or 15 year range? Yeah, you know, it's really um, depends on private, uh, private willingness to do so. Um, you know, that is a separate property owner, uh, and I don't know what their willingness is to, to develop that property um, or, or, or the time frame at which they're, they're looking to develop it. So these things are, are really, they're really kind of hard to say. Right. Um, so I don't know that I have an answer for you. I guess either way, I, I'm, I don't have a problem with what the developers proposing here. Any other comments? It sounds like there's not a whole lot of concern with this proposal and that's what I'm looking for. So thank you for your comments. 
Thank you, Aaron. Moving on to item 4E, distribution of the 2021-2022 budget work workbook. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I just briefly want to um, point out that what is included are budget documents you would have seen in the past. I do have uh, electronically, I've separated them by different PDFs. So when we're having our work sessions, hopefully if you're looking at the electronic version, it'll be a little easier for us to find the, the pages you're looking at. But um, there really isn't um, much difference of anything uh, that I've included in here this year. I, if I'd have had time, I was gonna talk a little bit about the CEP just to lighten the load on our budget workshop meeting, but we're already at our seven o'clock hour. So um, I don't know if any of you have any questions. It is a two-year budget. Um, we have 21, 22 and 22, 23. There are decision packages for both years. So make sure you're looking at the heading that says what year that decision package is in. We'll probably at our special council meeting really only focus on the decision packages for 21 and 22, but you'll see that they might have other requests out there coming in the next year as well. Are there any quick questions uh, before we go to our regular meeting? And of course, when you get to looking at the book or, or get to looking at any of these files, please call me, email me, phone me, whatever you need. If you have questions, I'll be happy to um, straighten any questions out you may have. So Teresa, the, the uh, special work session is next Tuesday at 5.30? It is. Um, so how much of this material are we planning to cover at that time? <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to say we'd <laughs> cover all of it, but okay. we never seem to get all the way through it. Um, and then some department heads uh, or departments will fill in on work sessions coming up at the second meeting in December or the first couple meetings in January. I, I won't have any evaluation information at all till January or any of that type of things, but we'll just see how far we get. I don't believe that uh, the committee has decided yet. I don't, I don't wanna speak out of turn. I'm not sure if we're meeting virtually or in person next Tuesday. Um, either, either one will work on, on my, my part, so. And just for the council as well, um, we've asked the department has to be very um, succinct in their comments, just really focusing on the changes that they're proposing in their budget, whether it's, uh, you know, going, you know, a positive or negative direction, I guess, and focus on presenting their decision packages. So hopefully we can get through most of these. It's really sort of a, a high view. There's a lot of detail there, but an overall view of the budgets and what's being proposed and really having the department heads focus for you on what some of the changes or what they're proposing that may be different from uh, previous budget years. And, and then as, as Teresa mentioned, well, we're, there's gonna be probably a few or even a few issues we might, we're, we're gonna break out and talk about at other work sessions um, between now and our uh, first um, work session on the budget. And uh, that'll be the second meeting in February, or excuse me, second meeting in January. Well, I see we've, we have three hours scheduled for the work session next week, um, and there's a lot of information to cover. So, so our department heads will have to be concise if we're gonna try and cover as much territory as Teresa wants us to. <laughs> Any other comments or questions on, on this item? If not, it is just a little bit past seven o'clock. So we will go ahead and adjourn the work session and uh, join uh, each other again in a minute or two when we uh, get started for the regular council meeting. We are adjourned. <laughs>